So let us hear the message today, brethren. Vamos a escuchar el mensaje en esta tarde, hermanos. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except the man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Beloved brethren, this message is titled, You Must Be Born Again. It's a must. There is no, if I feel like it, there is no, I'll leave it for tomorrow. I'll leave it for when I'm old. I'll leave it for when I can make some time. It is something necessary that we need to be determined in our hearts and in our minds. A very clear decision because Jesus was very clear in his words. When he spoke to Nicodemus, a man who was very studied in the Word of God, he was actually a teacher, a master of his time. And he went to Jesus by night because they could not help but to notice that this Jesus was healing the sick. This Jesus was raising the dead. This Jesus was doing things that no, of, none of them had ever been able to do. And they had not seen it in their lifetime either. And so when Nicodemus, being a master or a teacher of the law, goes to Jesus by night time, so that people would not see him go to Jesus, otherwise, you know, they would think, aren't you supposed to be a teacher? Why are you going to try and learn from that person? <laughs> The shame that sometimes, you know, comes upon those people because sometimes there's pride in between. But still, when Nicodemus went and Jesus said to him, you must be born again. A man who is supposed to interpret the law of God and lead the people to God was yet confounded because he was thinking in literal terms. He was thinking in a physical term. He was thinking in a, in a term of a, of a standard natural term. He would question and say, how is it that a, a man, once he's been born, he's come out of the womb, he's grown up already, how's he going to go back in the womb and be born again? <laughs> he was thinking in those terms, literally, because the scripture shows that. But when Jesus spoke these words and said unto him that I tell you verily that unless except a man be born again he cannot see the kingdom of God. He was referring to being born of the Spirit. And being born of the Spirit is not a work that we can do brethren. This is a work that comes from God and God alone. This is a work that comes from our Heavenly Father who moves the believer or, or the person who is about to believe the word, the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That the Holy Spirit, in hearing that message, the Holy Spirit works towards bringing repentance in that person's life. And when that person repents of their sin, recognizes before God that we have failed the Lord, that our life is a mess, that we are not gods, that we need God, that we are not self-sufficient, that we need He who is all-sufficient. And when we realize that we are only here for a time, and that we do not know it all, but we need Him who is omniscient, omnipresent, omnipotent, and we come before him and we say, I need Jesus. I need the Savior. Because you see, in all the time that we're walking up and down and all about and doing all our got to do's of this life, in our spirit, our conscience, the Lord is speaking and saying, where are you going to be tomorrow? What's going to happen if you died today? Where will you end up? without God. And so, in our conscience, there's always something that does not leave us alone. 
Because God's love is there, always speaking to us and reaching out to us. To let us know that all these things around us come and go. But God's word lasts forevermore. And when we come to that realization that all things have an end, even our life has an expiry date. The sad thing is that many of us don't know what that expiry date is. You know, we often go to the supermarket, we can look at the label and it says expires by such and such date or such and such year. But we don't know our expiry date on this earth. Mm -hmm. But even still, we can trust that God knows it. And He knows it very well. He knows us better than ourselves. But even in this, you see, when He was saying to Nicodemus that he needs to be born again, and unless we are born again, and now I'm speaking to the church, brethren, that unless we are born again, it is not just telling us, this scripture that we have read is not just telling us, brethren, that we cannot enter and enter into that kingdom of heaven to be for an eternity with God. But what this is saying to us as well, brethren, is that if we are not born again, at these born of the Spirit of God, then we shall not be able to see the kingdom of God move in this earth. We will not see the glory of God. And many of us, you know, when, when we were out in the world, you know, I'll, I'll put myself for an example. When I was lost in my life of drugs and out in the world in depression and in all the things that I used to be into, I would not be the type of person who would just go out and enjoy nature. I would not even look up and enjoy the clouds. I would not enjoy life because I hated myself. I hated the things that I would do and I hated everybody and I hated the world. And so this causes a blindness that we cannot see the beautiful things that God has done in this earth. We cannot see the glory of God because we are blinded. And this is what happens when we are not born again. People do not see the glory of God. You know, Jesus Christ, when he went and healed the daughter of Jairus, how Jairus said, come and heal my daughter because she lay dead. When Jesus entered into that house, there was all these people weeping and wailing, crying for that girl because she had passed away. And when Jesus enters and he only permitted three of his disciples to enter in with him, being Peter, John and Jacob. <coughs> when they entered, and James I mean, when they entered, Jesus said to those other people who were in the house, Why do you do all this? The girl's not dead, but she sleeps. And the Bible says that they laughed him to scorn. You know, that means they made mockery of him. They teased him. It's almost like saying, what's this person know about life? Because remember, Jesus was in his 30s, early 30s. I can imagine that there would have been older people there who would have said, what does this young fellow know? What's he going to teach us about life? And especially when a comment like that comes out, the Bible says they laughed him to scorn. But because these people would not believe that Jesus could raise the dead, Jesus cast them out. And when he had told them to get out, because if there's something that does not please God, is not having faith, is not believing God. Because in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, it says, Without faith, it is impossible to please God. And so when he got rid of all the people who were not willing to believe because they were blinded by their unbelief, he said, get out. They're not going to see the glory of God. They will remain blind because of the hardened heart. And so therefore, when he, when he had taken them out of the house, he said the words to the girl, I tell you, girl, get up. And she got up. And this was a miracle that the girl's parents saw this and his three disciples saw this. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. 
And when we see, brethren, that many times as a church, even as Christians, we sometimes go through difficult moments in our life. We sometimes go through moments where we spend probably months where we do not see the glory of God. And we need to check our spiritual life, brethren. Because, you see, today we have a glorious celebration of the Lord's Supper. But unless we are born again, we cannot see the glory of God. We cannot see the kingdom of God. And we need to understand that God wants us to see His glory. God wants our faith to increase. God wants us to fall more in love with Him and to trust Him even more than what we do today. And for that very reason, He wants to be glorified by His church. And not just the church, but by every tongue and nation in the world. But He has called you and I to be born again. Now, Nicodemus thought that this was just entering into the mother's womb and coming back out. <laughs> but that is not the case at all. Jesus was speaking to him about an internal birth, which flows from the inside outwardly, which begins at the very core of our being, which is the human spirit. As I've explained many times, we are a three-part being. God has made us Spirit, soul, and body. The body being this outer shell that we can see with our physical eyes. But we cannot see our soul. We cannot see that spiritual part of our spirit. But those things have their own function in our being. And they all coexist and combine to operate together. Without the human spirit, also known as the breath of life, that God has given to give us life, we would not be able to be in this world. It would just be a dead body, a dead carcass. But that breath of life that God has given us, which is our human spirit, is our consciousness, our awareness that there is a God. It is the part of us that allows us to connect with God and to commune with God. It is the part that the Holy Spirit, when God comes to make contact with mankind, He makes contact through the spirit of mankind, because God is spirit. And when there is that contact between our human spirit and the Lord's Holy Spirit, that is when things happen, brethren. But also in our soul is our self-consciousness, our self-awareness. Our awareness of our surroundings and then we have our body which without those areas it does not move on its own so when Jesus is talking about a new birth he is basically saying that we need to be born of the Spirit and to be born of the Spirit means that we had to have already been repented, received Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, so that we can, through the blood of Christ that was poured out at the cross of Calvary, something that is done through the faith, but yet something so real that even though we cannot see it, but when someone genuinely comes to be born again, when someone genuinely comes to be uh, forgiven their sins and receives Jesus as their Lord and Savior there is an incredible transformation and a birth from that very moment that at the time the person cannot explain it but they can feel it they cannot understand it fully but yet there is all this joy peace gladness a heavy weight of sin in our conscience that has been cleared and wiped away. And something that just without us knowing exactly how we just know in our spirit. If I die today, I go with him. 
This is what the Spirit of God comes to do. The promise of the Father. Because when we enter through Jesus Christ, brethren, through that blood that then cleanses away that wicked sin, then we are given life in the Spirit. Because it is the Holy Spirit of God who comes at that moment to make dwelling in us. And we become temple and dwelling place of the Holy Spirit of God. And this is because with the Spirit of God, He is life and life in abundance. And this is why then we get life in abundance in the Spirit. And so no more dead in the Spirit, but now alive in the Spirit. We can now connect with God the Father and speak to Him and hear from Him, receive from Him, be instructed by Him, be guided by Him. And this is something that we learn every day to grow in the Spirit as we have now been given birth, a new birth in the Spirit where the old things have passed away and behold, they are all new now in Christ Jesus our Lord. Hallelujah. This is what God does and this is what it means to be born again because there is a new beginning and just like in our physical beginning, you know, when we were a baby, <laughs> in the spiritual, we start growing and understanding. Many of us, you know, at first we didn't even know how to pray. I never knew how to pray. When I first tried to pray, I was like, what do I say? My mind went blank. I didn't know what, you know, the Bible says how to pray and everything. But all these things we then start to learn as we grow. And as like a, a baby, you know, who starts crawling, but then he starts, you know, getting to like one year old, a year and a half, and he starts sort of, you know, getting up on things like this, but his legs are still a bit wobbly, and it's like, well, watch it, otherwise you might fall. So he does make a few mistakes and falls, and then he cries. That happens to us spiritually as well, brethren. We start to walk with the Lord. We start to learn His Word, because that's what the Spirit of the living God does. He testifies of God and He points us to the Word. And the Spirit of God says, you haven't read my Word today. How about you go read my Word? And those who are led by the Spirit says, well, God knows what He wants. So I'm going to listen to the Spirit of the Lord. So I open up the Word. But then guess what? Because we're being led by the Spirit of the, God, of the Lord, when we open up the portion, it's exactly what I needed to know. It's exactly what I needed to read. It's exactly the petition that I've asked God. And there comes the response. Why does God do that? Because He gives witness that Jesus really is the Christ. He gives witness that the Holy Bible really is the Word of God. Because, you know, in the world today, there's so many people who question the Word. And it says, well, how do you know it's the Word of God? How do you know they've not mixed and changed it so much? How do you know that they this? And there's so much opposition to try and put doubt in the Bible. But yet God guides us to the truth. And this is what the Spirit of God does, brethren. So that we are no longer... In a world full of confusion, because there is much confusion in the world. But we thank God for His Holy Spirit and His promise, which He guides us onto all truth and to the righteousness of God. That as we walk with the Lord and we learn to walk in this path, He confirms His Word in our life through His Spirit. Praise the Lord. You know, the Bible says in the letter to the Romans that the Spirit of God gives witness with our spirit that we are the sons of God. And this is something, brethren, that as we walk in obedience to God, we will start to be able to feel in our spirit, in that connection that we have with God, if God is pleased with us or if He's not pleased with us. And this is something that we start to discern, we start to learn, we start to grow in the Spirit. Things that before we did not know because we were cut off from God's grace. But now through the Holy Spirit, we have been given that beautiful grace of the Holy Spirit of God. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Now, brethren, how is it 
that a Christian believer, because we're talking about being born again, we're talking about those who take part in the Lord's Supper, in the, in the bread and in the fruit of the vine. We are talking about those who take part in the significance of what it means to take part in the body and in the blood of Christ. Now, when we are talking about how does a Christian live, brethren, his life? How is it that someone can live rejoicing? How is it that someone can, even in the middle of a dark and, and a destructive world full of corruption, how is it that a Christian can live going from victory to victory, from glory to glory, walking and living the promises of God in our life? Because I'll tell you what, things get worse in the world. And they're not going to get better, they're going to get worse. But yet, how is it that a Christian can be victorious in this world full of evil? Even though we as Christians, you know, just because we believe in Jesus, just because we've come to Christ, it doesn't mean that all our problems just vanished away. No, we still have problems. We still have trials and difficulties that we have to go through. But it pleases the Father that through every trial and through every difficulty that we have to go through, He has a teaching for us. He has something to mold and shape our character, to make it less of ourselves and more like Christ Jesus our Lord. And that's why these things are necessary to shape us. You know, the uh, local church have these crosses here. But the thing is that the Bible teaches us that the cross which we must carry is not a cross that is a physical carrying. Or it's not a cross that I need to carry or tattoo or carry like this. It is the cross that Jesus said, He... Who wants to be my disciple? Let him come after who he wants to come after me. Let him take up his cross daily. He said, Let him deny himself, take his cross daily, and follow me. You know what that means, brethren? When Jesus was actually carrying the cross physically, when he was taken to Golgotha, the place of the skull, which is a, like a waste place where they had the, the vile and the cruel people where they would go and kill murderers and all that. That's where they, they crucified our Lord Jesus. And when he carried the cross, it was not an easy thing. It was a symbol of suffering for the cause of the Lord. Our cross, which we carry, brethren, is daily. And this is a cross that even though it's not a physical cross, it is a spiritual cross. It is the cross of suffering for the cause of Jesus Christ. But you know what's good about that cross that we carry as Christians? It's because when we carry that suffering for the Lord's sake, when we obey the Lord and we are made to suffer for His sake, it is something that we are rewarded. It is something that we are blessed. It is something that we are comforted by the Holy Spirit of the Lord. You want to see that in the scripture? I don't have it up there because I'm just receiving this now. But let's look at the Beatitudes in Matthew chapter 5. Look at what Jesus said now. He's not talking about somebody not having problems. Look how many problems this person would have. But look at what Jesus says. In Matthew chapter 5 verse 2 to 12 about problems he said blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven blessed are they that mourn for they shall be comforted blessed are the meek and that is the humble for they shall inherit the earth blessed are they which do hunger and thirst for right after righteousness for they shall be filled blessed are the merciful for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, 
for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. This is the cross that we carry, brethren. The cross of suffering. But it is the one that Jesus taught us to carry. It is the one that has blessing. It is the one that has promise. It is the one where we see the glory of God. It is the one of those who are born again. Born of the Spirit. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. And so, beloved brethren, to take part in the Holy Communion, we need to be born again. You see, when we look at John chapter 3 verse 5, in John chapter 3 verse 5, the scripture says to us, Jesus answered. Now, he was still talking to Nicodemus. We're going back to John where we started, but we're looking at verse 5. He says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except the man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. When we look at the water and we look at the Spirit, we need to understand what Jesus is meaning, what he's trying to make us understand. You see, this is a threefold salvation of the Father, the Son, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit. The three of them being one God. He manifests Himself to us in these three forms. That we may try to comprehend He which is beyond our comprehension. But in this way, God throughout the entire Bible manifests Himself as God the Father, as God the Son, and as God the Holy Spirit. And in doing so, brethren, he says that we need to be born of the water and of the Spirit. Now, I've spoken a bit about the Spirit already, because that's talking about the Holy Spirit of God. But when we talk about the water, being born of that water, let's look at John chapter 15, verse 3. And this will give the answer of what does it mean to be born of the water. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. It says here, Now you are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. You see, it is the word of God which cleanses us. It is the word of God that tells us how we need to live our life. It is the word of God that as we hear the instruction of the word, because remember, Jesus Christ is that living word. And when we, you know, receive that living word, when we obey that living word, we are walking, abiding in Christ. Jesus said, if you abide in me, I will abide in you. And I and my father shall come and dwell in you. How will the Father and Jesus come and dwell in us? His Holy Spirit. So this is something, brethren, that we are guided as Christians through His Word, but also through His Spirit. And this is what it means to be born of the water and of the Spirit. Because somebody cannot say, I am Christian, but does not obey the Word of God. Somebody cannot say, I am Christian, but does not obey the voice of the Holy Spirit speaking in their conscience, which only leads them to obey the Word of God. And this is what it means for us Christians that take part in the Holy Communion, in the body and in the blood of Christ. That if we are abiding in Christ, then it means that we need to be abiding in His Word. Abiding in His Spirit. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. This is what it means to be born. And Jesus said that scripture that we read. When we go back to John chapter 3 verse 5. When we go back to that verse. Where He said, Verily, verily, I say to you. 
Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. So this is not just about me filling my mind with knowing the Word. I need to also know the living Word. I need to be able to connect in the Spirit with God because God is Spirit. I need to offer worship to the Lord in the Spirit because Jesus said, And now the time is when those who worship God will worship Him in Spirit and in truth. But how can I do that? How can I please God if I don't know Him? How can I please Him if I don't walk in the way that He tells me to walk? And this is the way, brethren. Jesus said, I am the truth, the way, and the life. None can get to the Father if not through me. And how has He left for that to happen? He said, I must go now, but I will not leave you. I will send forth the promise, the Comforter, the Holy Spirit of God. Hallelujah. Amen. And so this is what it means to be born again, brethren. A believer who obeys the Word a believer who lives the word, a believer who allows themselves to be guided by the Spirit of God, which leads us always to obey the word of God. And when we look at John chapter 3 verse 6, Jesus makes a clear distinction because there's no in between here. There is a clear distinction. It's either white or it's black. It's either heaven or hell. It says, That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. We were born, physically speaking, in the flesh. This is why we have the desires of flesh, because our parents' blood is in us. When our parents you know, conceived and we were in the womb, we have their DNA, we have of their blood, we have of their customs in us and their, you know, features in our face and some look like their mother, some look like their father, some look like their, somebody in the family, in that bloodline and our characteristics are a mix and a mingle of someone in the bloodline as well. And this is why we have different characteristics in life. But even still, with all these things, these things are in our blood, brethren. And because of this, stemming all the way from Adam and Eve, who fell from grace in sin, died how God said they will die, this is why we carry on that curse and we grow old and die. But even still, you know, when Paul wrote the letter to the church and he said, Oh, wretched man that I am, when he was talking about this topic, about the desires of the flesh, he goes, What I want to do, I don't do. But that which I don't want to do, that's what I find myself doing. You see, he was speaking about those desires of the flesh. That battle that's in our mind that says, I want to serve the Lord. But the flesh says, Oh, but it's too cold to get up from bed and pray. Oh, I want to go to church today and give God the worship as the Word says. Oh, but you know, I've been invited to a barbecue. And that sounds nice and tasty. So, what decision are we going to make, brethren? Because the desires of the flesh are there battling with the Spirit. And the Scripture says, so that you do not do the things that you want. <laughs> Hallelujah. Because I'll tell you what, if we did the things we want, we would go with the, we, we, we would go with the flesh. Because it's the easy path. And we would lose ourselves in the flesh. But praise be God for the Holy Spirit. Who does not leave us nor forsake us. And He's always there. Guiding us, leading us, speaking in our spirit. Speaking in our conscience and guiding us. To praise Him, to worship Him. And as we worship Him and as we draw closer to Him. You see, because, because we have this blood in us. But praise be the name of Jesus for His blood. Because by faith we receive His blood. And His blood is sprinkled upon us and cleanses us 
of all those evil things. This is why, brethren, when there are people that by generation, you know, one person might have been a diabetic, but then their child was a diabetic, or it might have skipped the, it might have skipped the uh, uh, generation, and then the grandchild was a diabetic, and that's how the doctor will explain it to the person, even though the person's looked after their health, you know, looked after their sugar levels, is a very fit person, but yet ended up getting sick. Because it's in our blood, brethren, the desires of the flesh are there. And the wages of sin is death. And so then Paul would say, Oh, this wretched man that I am, who will free me from this body of corruption? But then he gives the answer in the, towards the end of Romans chapter 7. He says, I praise God for Jesus Christ. Because you see that blood of Jesus that was poured on us, that blood that we've received through faith. It's enough to also break the generational curses. It's enough to break all those things. Praise be the Lord. When we abide in Christ and we have the living spirit, we have the healing spirit. We have the spirit of life and life in abundance. Hallelujah. And this is what God you know, calls us to do. To remember this living God. To remember this all powerful God when we take part in the Holy Communion. Because it was by the victory in Jesus Christ that we have come, brethren, to receive this great blessing. And when we look at John chapter 3 verse 8, the scripture also continues to say there. And he describes what it is like to live in the spirit. What's it like to live in the spirit, you might ask? Jesus said, the wind blows where it listeth, where it wants. And he says, and you hear the sound thereof, but you cannot tell where it comes and where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. So what this means, brethren, is that when we are born of the Spirit, we are no longer to guide our own life. You see, before Jesus, we were the property of Satan. We were the puppet of Satan. We thought that we were in control, but really it was the devil in control. And that's why we were buried in our sins. We were dead to God in our spirit. But now that Jesus Christ has given us of his grace and mercy, we have come to receive Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. We have been taken not to be the property of the devil anymore, but we have been sanctified and we have been separated for God. And now that we are separated for God, it means that we need to be submissive to the Lord. So that means I cannot go and do what I want to do. It means I need to do what God wants me to do. And this is a personal walk. I've always described it this way, brethren, that God has a special destiny for you and me. That no one else can fill it. Only you can. Because what makes you is unique. What makes me is unique. And the path that I go with God, you cannot enter into the kingdom of God going on that one. Because your personal life, God, has marked other things for you. There are certain talents and gifts. There are certain trials and tribulations that you have to go through that I may never even know about. Just like the ones I have to go through, but you may never even have to go there. Because it's like a signature that is unique only for you. Like a signature, unique only for me. That no one else can make it there because it's marked out for your life, for my life. And when we see about this, about the Spirit, you know, you remember the case of Abraham. You know, Abraham didn't have a Bible. But yet he heard the voice of the Spirit. The voice of God. And it said to him, Abraham, leave your father's house. I will take you to a land far from here that is flowing with milk and honey, and I will make a nation from you. Now, that didn't actually come to pass in his lifetime. It was several hundred years after that he began to fruition. But yet, he heard the voice of God. Now, just as we hear the wind, we're like, which way is the wind coming from? But we feel it then when it comes. But yet, we don't know then what course it's going to take. You know, Abraham went believing God, but he did not know that he was going to have to encounter many problems along the way. He did not know exactly how long all these things were going to take. 
He did not know when God was going to give him his first child. I'll tell you what he did know. That he was filled with impossibilities. Because to start with, his wife was barren and she couldn't have children. Secondly, they were already past the age to be able to have children. <laughs> Should we keep going? Impossibility after impossibility after impossibility. But he believed God when God spoke to him. And so the scripture says that the wind blows where it wants to. And you hear the sound thereof, but you cannot tell where it comes and where it goes. So is everyone that is born of the Spirit. You know, when God starts to guide our life on a personal level, we will be asked by God. God will want us to do things. And those things, of course, they are scriptural. They are in line with His Word. But at the same time, those things are paths that we need to take in the Lord. They are decisions that we need to take in the Lord, just like Abraham had to make decisions. And there are some very hard decisions along the way. But God has promised that He would always guide us and lead us onto the truth. And this is all a teaching for us, brethren. Why? It's a teaching so that we can get to know Him. That we can get to be docile. That we can get to be, uh, the word for it is, in a way, know the Spirit of God. That when it is God, and when it's not God. God wants us to know Him very, very intimately. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. And when we get to know God on a very, very intimate way, God will be able to do mighty deeds in your life. Mighty deeds in my life. We will see constantly the glory of God. We will be walking daily, seeing the victories of God. Amen. The pouring out of His blessings, even in the middle of trials and difficulties. We will learn to be of those Christians that when the problem comes, we will not complain about it, but we will be giving off thanks, remembering His Word, which says that all things that come, come for our good. And so therefore, when there are moments that even though we cannot understand them, what will be the outcome? Because, you know, as human beings, we, we like to be very, you know, we like to know when our paycheck is going to come. We like to know what's going to happen after. We like to know if this fails, what's going to happen then. We like to make plans. But when it comes to God and trusting God, if it pleases God not to tell you the end result, He'll just tell you, do this. <laughs> and he will expect you to obey and trust him. Just like Abraham had to trust him. Abraham didn't know the fruition of exactly when everything was going to happen. But every now and then God would come and comfort him. And speak to him. And manifest himself to him in many different ways. Did Abraham see the glory of God? Yes he did. Many occasions. God appeared to Abraham. Remember in Genesis chapter 18. When God decided he was going to go and look at what the sin that was happening in Sodom and Gomorrah. And two angels accompanied him. And God manifested himself in what would be called a Christophany. In the form of a human being, but not God in all his glory. But yet he manifested himself to the point that Abraham, through the Spirit, and already knowing the voice of the Lord, he could identify in the Spirit. That even though his eyes were seeing a human being, but he knew... That that manifestation, who that person really was inside, was his very Lord. And so he came out and he bowed down and he said, My Lord, you know, if it please you, let us prepare some food here so that you, you know, rest yourself under the tree. And that was when God gave him the promise and said, This time next year, you, your wife shall conceive a child. And that was Isaac. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. And so see, all these things, brethren... We see them along the way. We see them in the midst of the impossibilities. Because Abraham didn't know the day that God was going to appear to him. But God knows the perfect time when you need to see the next miracle. God knows the perfect time when you need to have that experience, that encounter with the Holy Spirit of God, which is going to fill you with the strength of the joy of the Lord. Hallelujah. And this is what it means, brethren, to walk in the Spirit, to flow in the Spirit, to be in obedience to the Lord, 
and so that we may develop our spiritual ear, our spirit, to be very sensitive to the Lord, to His voice, to know when it is Him, to know when it is the enemy, because the enemy sometimes can come and whisper as well, oh, even though we don't see Him. We can hear the voice and it says, do this and this and this. And sometimes it might even speak to us, even what's written in the scripture, like it did to Jesus. Remember the Bible says that the devil appeared after he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights and he was hungered. And he says, if you are the son of God, command that this stone be turned into bread. He was quoting certain parts of scripture. You know, when he said, throw yourself down from the top of the temple, because it is written, and he went to Psalm 91, it is written, the devil said to Jesus, that the angels will come so that your feet do not dash upon the stones, you know. But he was using the scripture in a twisted way, not in the correct interpretation. Jesus responded with the word in the right way, and he says, it is also written, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. And this is what God teaches us, brethren, along the way. He teaches us not just only to live in this life, in this reality, but He also teaches us to understand that we have an enemy that is spiritual, that moves in the high and wicked places, that moves the things that are in the realm of the literal that we see around us. And so the victory of God is so great that He wants us to understand His voice and that we be not deceived by the voice of the enemy. And this is what God calls us for, brethren. But we must be born again. And so then, brethren, for those of us who have been walking, you know, it is time now we must analyze our life. How have you been walking with God? How have I been walking with God? Because you see, when we come to take part in the Lord's Supper, the Apostle Paul wrote these words in 1st of Corinthians chapter 11 verse 27 to 32. He was speaking to the church of Corinthians about the Lord's Supper. And he was telling them, Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and the blood of Christ of the Lord but let a man let everyone examine themselves and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup for he that eats and drinks unworthily eats and drinks damnation to himself not discerning the Lord's body you see it is important that we discern the Lord's body that we discern what is pleasing to the Lord, that we discern how we are with the Lord, that we discern how is the Spirit of God within me? Is He pleased? Is He not happy with me? Have I, have I quenched the Spirit? Have I grieved the Spirit? Or have I pleased the Spirit by obeying his voice by obeying the word of God and so the scripture says for he it says for this cause it says in, in verse uh, 30 please 30 we go to verse 30 yes please for this cause are many weak and sick among you and many sleep and for if we, if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we are <coughs> punished, chastened of the Lord, that we should not be condemned with the world. Praise the Lord. This was something that the Apostle Paul spoke to the church because, you see, Jesus taught Jesus would reveal to the Apostle Paul the correct order in the church. He would reveal to the Apostle Paul how his things, God's things need to be done. In which reverence it needs to be done. And so therefore, 
This is what the Apostle Paul wrote to the church, guided, inspired by the Holy Spirit of God. That he said that if people just take this, just come up and go, oh yeah, just another day. And do not discern the body of Christ. That God is holy. And he commands us to be holy. That what we see, he said, if you, unless we are born again, we cannot see the kingdom of God. And so then we need to understand, brethren, that what God is saying to us in this message is we need to discern our life. Are we born of the water and of the spirit? Are we flowing in the living water of God, His Word, and also in obedience to His Holy Spirit? If the answer is yes, after you analyze your life, if the answer is yes, then you may take part in the Holy Communion, in the body and blood of Christ. But if the answer is no, I've not been obeying God. I've not been uh, born of the Spirit because I do not follow the Spirit of God. I do not obey His voice. I do not obey His word. In my conscience, He says to me that I need to repent. That I need to fix this and that. Then it is better to fix what we need to fix before God. So that we can be right before God. And so that this can be a blessing for us. And not a curse. Because it is God's will. That we receive blessing upon blessing. But also God knows how to correct us as well. Because as his word says that God being a loving father. Corrects him who he loves. If our father did not love us. He would not correct us. He would be like many parents in the world today, that they idolize their children, they don't even do anything to them, you know, they don't teach them the right and the wrong. They let their children do anything and everything, but those children, when they grow up, they grow up to be murderers, rapists, in the jails, people who break the law, and some of them even kill their own parents. That is not love. But our God, who is our Father, loves us. And so when he needs to correct us, he also corrects us. But this is why Paul left it in the scripture and he says, let each person analyze themselves. Because each of us has human spirit. Each of us can see in our conscience how God is telling us how we are before him. So at this point, brethren, let us come into words of prayer.